Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, my talk is about a vector OPM with a freely definable sensitive axis for use in Earth's magnetic field. First of all, I want to introduce my department, uh, which is the Department of Quantum Systems at the Leibniz IPHT in Jena. Since 1995, we are developing uh, SQUIDs, and since 2008, also OPMs. And these sensors are used for a broad range of applications, like, for example, mineral exploration, archaeological prospection, but also biomagnetic uh, tasks like fetal MCG, or even fundamental uh, physics like exon search for the, for, the, for the GNOME project. Our group is mainly interested in the, in the development of sensors suited for unshielded operation. This is because of, uh, because, ah, okay. Oh. This is because, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is mainly because uh, geomagnetic applications are always unshielded. But also biomagnetic applications would benefit from unshielded operations because magnetic shielding equipment, of course, is bulky and expensive. Most, um, many of our applications are still based on squids, and of course, they would benefit from an adequate squid alternative. One of these adequate alternatives are these surf OPMs because they provide a similar sensitivity as well as the ability to do vectorial measurements, but they can only be operated in nanotesla range, so that they are not suited for unshielded measurements. So what remains in our case is the use of OPMs, uh, of sc scalar OPMs that can be used in Earth's magnetic field. The disadvantage of scalar OPMs is, of course, that they, in the basic configuration, they do not provide vector information, so localization of magnetic sources is more difficult. And secondly, they are not sensitive, or they are only sensitive to directions uh, to, they are only sensitive in the direction parallel to the background field. And this can be explained by these uh, two images here. So let's assume we are operating an Earth's magnetic field of about 50 microtesla, and we want to measure an anomaly of one nanotesla. If these two vectors are aligned, then the scalar value changes exactly by one nanotesla, and everything is fine. But if these two vectors are perpendicular to each other, I measure only a change of 10 femtoteslas in the scalar value. And this is explained by this uh, Pythagoras-like equation, where the perpendicular, perpendicular value is suppressed by the background field. So what we need is a low noise vector magnetometer whose sensitive axis is not longer determined by the Earth's magnetic field, but can be freely defined by the operator. And this is achieved by using a scalar OPM, which is exposed uh, to a strong bias magnetic field, whose magnetic, mag or which, with a magnetic field amplitude is at least one order of magnitude larger than the Earth's magnetic field. Because in this case, the sensitive axis is always defined by this bias magnetic field. The advantage of this approach is that the vector component is, or can be determined by a high precision measurement of the Lamer frequency which can be very accurate. And this bias magnetic field is generated by a Halbach cylinder, which is shown here, uh, using permanent magnets. This setup provides an excellent spatial homogeneity of less than 100 nanoteslas variation within the dimensions of the vapor cell. And the magnetic noise generated by this Permanent magnets is assumed to be negligible, at least it's much less than compared to an electromagnetic solution. And the whole setup is designed for vanishing temperature dependence around room temperature. So we now discuss uh, this OPM sensor head here, which is placed in the center of this uh, magnetic field generating system. The OPM sensor head, or yeah, you can, you can see here the OPM sensor head. We use an external lab laser, which is coupled to the sensor head via an optical fiber. Um, here this is the collimation lens, which collimates the beam to about five millimeters in di diameter. And here is a combination of a linear polarizer and a Wollaston prism. The Wollaston prism splits the beam into two subbeams uh, with orthogonal polarization. And the linear polarizer can be used by rotating this Linear polarizer, we can uh, balance the intensity of these two subbeams to be equal. 
Then there are wedge prisms so that the beams get aligned. And after the after they pass the quarter wave plate, we obtain uh, two beams with uh, circular polarization with opposite helicity. These now enter into the so-called oven, which is basically a thermally isolated chamber, equipped with two windows, optical windows, of course. And also a B1 call, also an, an RF call for the generation of the oscillating B1 magnetic field. Inside the oven, there's the vapor cell, the cesium vapor cell, operated at 125 degrees Celsius. And this, uh, this cell is equipped with an ITO heater, so that which is the, the, the ITO is an indium tin oxide layer, which is deposited on the windows so that the windows are the hottest spot of this uh, cell and that there is no cesium condensation within the optical path. Now I want to discuss the operational principle. We use our so-called LSD-MZ operational principle, which can be found in the literature. And this uses a microfabricated vapor cell, as we've seen before which uses a higher buffer gas pressure of about 180 millibars. As a consequence, the D1 hyperfine transitions overlap, and I can use a single laser to couple to both ground states. So I tune this laser such that it uh, couples strongly to the, to the F equal to three ground state, which leads to a strong depletion of this ground state. And it also, also moderately couples to the F equal to four ground state, so that the population distribution is shifted towards the stretched states. So for sigma plus, it's shifted to the right side here, and for sigma minus to the left side. So what I obtain are two magneto, well, is one, one signal for each beam, shown like here, such a transmission dip. And these transmission dips are symmetrically shifted on the frequency axis due to the nonlinear Zeeman effect and also due to the light shift of the laser. And if I subtract these two signals from each other, I get the red curve, which shows a dispersive-like shape with a zero crossing exactly at the length of frequency. Why are we using this LFD and Z configuration? Well, we are operating in strong magnetic fields, and this means that we have somehow, somehow have to handle the nonlinear Zeeman effect, which causes, in our case, a splitting of about 1.4 kilohertz uh, of these uh, Siemens uh, levels. So this, this issue is shown here for the case of a coated vacuum cell. Due to the splitting, the overall magnetometer performance is quite poor. If we now replace this vacuum cell by a small vapor cell with a higher buffer gas pressure and uh, operated at a higher temperature, then, we opt, then these uh, amplitudes increase and also the widths increase so that these individual transitions overlap, like shown here. And the obtained signal appears as a single broad line with a much higher amplitude so that the overall slope is, is deeper than before. And also the requirements for the homogeneity of the bias field are relaxed because it's now much broader. If we now furthermore apply the LSTMZ pumping, the population is concentrated towards the stretched states. So we obtain the night light narrowing effect, which reduces the thin exchange relaxation and makes these resonances uh, narrower. And also fewer semen resonances occur because most of these states here are empty. They are not uh, occupied. So, what, so the, in the end, we obtain a magnetometer signal, so the, the, the black line here, um, which has a very large amplitude, which is quite narrow, and which has a very steep slope, even in, uh, in, in the case of uh, strong background fields. So this is the main advantage of this approach. Other advantages are that this different signal, this red curve here, is inherently robust against technical noise, like, for example, laser intensity variations. The Lehmer frequency is not affected by light shifts because both uh, subcurves here, the, the black and the green one, are always shifted symmetrically. And there is no need for log-in detection or for high-frequency signal acquisition. We just have to cover the bandwidth of the magnetometer, which is around a few kilohertz. So now I want to show the most important experimental results. First of all, the proof of the vectorial measurement principle. For this, we applied a magnetic field by using Helmholtz coils 
um, parallel as well as orthogonal to the bias field. And as you can see, in the case of a parallel application, we obtain a linear dependency. And in the case of an orthogonal application, the, the, um, the dependency is strongly suppressed. So it's basically a single axis vector magnitude. We also measured noise and bandwidth. Uh, in this, for, for these measurements, we applied uh, the OPM in such a feedback loop so that the operating point is always fixed. And of course, we also uh, measured the noise in a three layer uh, mu metal shielding barrier. So the noise was uh, better than 60 femtoteslas in this range between 100 hertz and 600 hertz. It goes even down a bit less than uh, 50 femtoteslas for some frequencies. Um, it should be mentioned that between the, or in the range between 10 hertz and 100 hertz, which is here this range, the noise is dominated by um, vibrations of this shielding barrel. So the intrinsic spectrum could even look a bit better than shown here. And the short noise is around 5 femtoteslas per square root hertz. So for measuring the bandwidth, we applied a white noise test signal, which is shown here in the, in the red curve. And you can see that the bandwidth in the closed loop operation is about two kilohertz, or maybe even a bit more than two kilohertz. So the last uh, result is the temperature dependence of this magnetometer system. This Halbach cylinder or this magnetometer system was initially cooled uh, in a climate chamber and then or, uh, heated or cooled in a climate chamber and then transferred back to the lab within a few minutes. And then we, we monitored the Lehmer frequency as well as the magnet temperature during the warm up or cool down. And by doing this, we obtained here these curves. And you can see that uh, around 40 degrees Celsius, this curve is extremely fat. It, it exhibits a, a top. So this means that there is some point with vanishing temperature dependence. And if depending on the application, if we need an application, with a very stable bias magnetic field, we could apply a regulated heating to this, uh, to this vanishing point here to about 40 degrees. And then the bias field should be stable over days. Okay, so to summarize everything, um, we presented a new approach for a vectorial OPM, which can be operated in Earth's magnetic field. Uh, for this, the, we use a scalar OPM, with, which is embedded in a strong bias magnetic field, which is generated by a Halbach cylinder of permanent magnets. The sensitive axis is always defined by this bias magnetic field, which can be set by the operator. And one advantage is that uh, the vector component of interest is traced back to a high precision frequency measurement, so it can be done very accurately. And of course, dead zones are also avoided because the magnetometer is always aligned with the bias field. We achieved a very low magnetic noise of less than 60 femtoteslas per square root hertz and even a much lower short noise of 5 femtoteslas per square root hertz. And the closed loop bandwidth is about 2 kilohertz. Maybe this is a world record in the relative sensitivity. We are not exactly sure, but maybe. And uh, for the future, we are interested in measuring the long-term stability of uh, this bias field, especially if we apply this heating. Um, and of course, we are interested in reducing the technical noise because as you can see, the, the, the measured noise and the shot noise are one order of magnitude. Uh, there's one order of magnitude in between. So maybe there is still some huge potential in uh, improving the sensor noise. And of course, we would also like to build a compact uh, setup for field measurements. And we already started. So as you can see, the, the, um, the lab laser, which was fiber coupled, is now here replaced by a laser diode, which is directly implemented on the sensor head. But uh, yeah, measurements have still, put, still to be done. So thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in more details, I recommend you our new I, I, rec I can recommend you our new preprint, which is now an archive. Thank you very much.